This is Tom Trebojevic, fullback for the Manly Ringer Seagulls, and you're listening to the Supercoach Champions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the NRL Supercoach Champions Podcast. I'm Joe Fitz. With the Women's Origin game, the only footy I can recall happening in more than a week, it's a break we all needed to recharge our Supercoach batteries for the run home. Here to help me navigate this tricky period for Supercoach is a man so far behind on points you'd think he was coached by Paul Green. It's Wilf. How are you, mate? Not bad. Similar to you, I'm only recalling that there's uh, one all in the series wins at the moment for the Origin. Mm-hmm. So- the mighty Queenslanders took out the, the most important competition. That's the NRL Women's State of Origin. And, uh... <laughs> Had a, uh, I, I work for a, an organisation that's got offices across Australia and let's just say Monday morning I sat down to a meeting and a bloke from South Australia uh, about an hour into a meeting went, it wasn't Origin last night. How come you guys aren't talking about it? And it was just dead silence for about 30 seconds before he realised that he really shouldn't have opened his mouth. So there you go. I guess the good thing is is uh, Bear is a proud New South Welshman, so good thing he's not on to gloat about it. Our special guest that we had lined up is also a blue, and whether it's um, by fortune or not, he was not available, so we'll have to introduce him next week so you guys can sit tight for that. But speaking of Bear, we want to share some really exciting news. So obviously he's taken a bit of a break because his missus was about to pop. Well, officially she has popped now. And a massive congratulations to Bear and his new family, uh, now an additional member, another little boy. So yeah, that's really exciting. Everyone's fit and healthy, uh, maybe a little bit sleep deprived, but yeah, they're all going strong there. And we'll hopefully get Bear on to catch up with him in the coming weeks. Once he uh, once he starts catching up on sleep uh, with him and Mrs. Bear. So, yeah, really congrats to Bear. And he's got a pretty hard task ahead of him, far harder than what we've got because ours is just a fantasy game, mate. Um, still a bit behind uh, around 20K, as we've mentioned before. I'm around 4K. Absolutely. There's plenty of work for the both of us to do, me more so than yourself, but... Yeah, uh, it's an important week, so we'll dive straight into the team list for starters, and then we'll dissect the strategy a little bit more about how to navigate the five trades this week, as well as really how to deal with some pretty pressing issues, which uh, I'm sure everyone is more than painfully aware of. Stephen, I like your hustle. That's why it was so hard to cut you. Congratulations, the rest of you made the team. Except you, you and you. Two absolute blockbusters this week, which is really exciting for the return to NRL. The first one being Roosters Storm Thursday Night Wilf. Most of the big guns are back. Not all of them, of course, with Pappenhaus and a notable omission, mate. Uh, what's jumping out at you uh, with this game? Yeah, firstly, I think this is another time where we really should be complaining about the scheduling for the NRL. Like, I think everyone could see this is going to be a good matchup. And why would you put it right in the middle of the origin period? It just seems crazy. And the reality is, is even though Teddy's named, there is some doubt over him. I think anyone who watched Origin could see that little bum bag he was carrying around. Uh, <laughs> and it, yeah, it obviously something's going on with that hip pointer injury that still he must still be carrying. It's the first time Teddy's ever had something described as a little bum that he's rocking there, mate. It's usually packing some serious, uh, serious meat. Or well, how else does that? You know, that the junk in his trunk is how he gets all that acceleration off the mark. So fair call. Uh, but look, I think it's going to be a tough game for the Roosters. They do get Sam Walker back, which is pretty good for them, especially if Teddy is not going to be able to back up or if Robert decides to rest him. But I reckon he'll play just because the Roosters really need this game to really stay in touch with that top four. Manu back in the centres and Swali is on the extended bench. But if Teddy's not back, then I assume we'll see that same reshuffle where Manu goes back to full back and Swali comes straight back in to right centre. The good news, they do get Tupanua back as well as Sam Walker. So I think we'll have to see how that shakes out. Uh, I assume Angus, he didn't, I mean, he still played decent minutes in Origin, but there's long enough of a turnaround here. I reckon he'll be playing his normal minutes against the Storm because, again, they'll need him. Yeah, it's, it's about as healthy as the Roosters are going to get this year. Obviously, Colin's out for the year. Um, 
friend retired, Cordner retired, uh, and obviously Brett Morris as well. So this is basically it, Roosters fans. You're, you're going to have to see what your final uh, Roosters team looks like moving forward against the Storm. Except Victor the Inflictor is back next week. Oh, of course. <laughs> and you still own him, don't you? I do. Precious extra buy cover. <laughs> Speaking of the Storm, uh, I mean, still no Pappenhausen, but... I have to say the update the Frank Benissi gave this week seemed the most positive. It sounded almost like the Storm were choosing to rest him this week as opposed to they had no choice but to keep resting him because he was showing symptoms. And it looks really promising for round 18. I'm not. I'm trying not to be too influenced by the fact that I'm still holding Pappenhausen, but I, I do, it definitely seemed like a, a real positive for Paps that he should be able to play round 18. And hopefully that's going to be in Melbourne for them. So Nico Hines, I mean, we kind of talked about it in an earlier episode, but I, I'm leaning towards holding him. I know some want to sell him because Max Price and they're getting a bit concerned about that break even, which is floating around that 130, 136, in fact. But I mean, if you've still got Hines in your center wing, you're holding him, aren't you? Oh, I, I do, and I am. Um, I just think it, what's been pretty conclusively proven in Supercoach this year uh, is that, you know, it, it's basically points are just about the only thing that matters. I know we're all running low on trades and we're all going to be screaming about why did we waste so many, you know, in a few weeks when we've run out, but um, it has been a sprint from the start and you need all the points you can get and, and you know, I wouldn't be selling someone who's averaging 83 uh, on the year at all. Especially when he's available at centre wing. And look, he's got 136 break even. Even if he scores 60, he's only dropping about another 50, 55 grand. And that's still going to price him at about 770,000. I think the extra points, I mean, I, I think 60 is very conservative. I reckon he's going to hit 80 minimum. If not, look, I wouldn't be shocked if he tons up. We, we talked about it. as good as the Roosters are, they're still leaking a lot of points. So I think the Storm could definitely still do well. And if there's any concerns over Munster, for example, or, you know, they still don't have Harry Grant here, I just kind of think there's an opportunity here for points to be scored. And if Hines goes 100, he barely drops anything price-wise, and then he won't play around 17. And if perhaps is around 18, you can cash out Hines very easily. Uh, you can almost do a straight stop straight to Pappenhausen, for example, for maybe an extra 40 grand if that's really what happens in round 18. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with holding Heinz for another week there. Yeah, absolutely. It uh, very, very much makes sense. And like I said, you know, my philosophy is, is all about uh, maximising points at this stage. I think uh, Brandon Smith as well, notably Aaron Booth is on the interchange bench, but given that uh, Harry Grant's out for several more weeks, the people who did jump on the cheese um, are obviously going to hold and, and he seems to be pretty much the number one hooking option until Grant gets fit. Uh, and people without you know him are just going to have to pray he doesn't keep crossing the line. It's an insane scoring rate, isn't it? Just how often he does it, not just at the hooker, but even if he's first receiver and close to the line just crashes over, just uh, yeah, real, got a real nose for it. I mean, is it viable, honestly, once Harry Grant is back, but maybe your best hooking combination is actually Grant and Smith at hooker and hoping that the cheese keeps getting that 20-odd minutes at, at, at the start and then playing for another 30 or 35 in the middle and still getting some good opportunities for attacking stats like... There's just no viable other options. I mean, Damien Cook has famously fallen in a super coach hole this year. Braley um, has collapsed after a super strong start. He's um, Even his tackle numbers are down, much less his attacking stats. Connor Watson uh, is getting stuffed around regularly, although hopefully he goes back to that 50-minute kind of bench utility role uh, that he played so well at times earlier in the year. But... Yeah, there just isn't much else in the way of options. Um, so yeah, a double double storm hooker, uh, you know, could absolutely be the way to go on the run home. I think for me, realistically, with my trade numbers and the fact that right now I've got the double knights pairing of Braley and Watson there, I think realistically I might end up only being able to get one of them. So I could just be holding one of the knights guys until Grant's back and then try try make that work. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next game, which we've got the Warriors and the Dragons. What's your read on this game so far? Uh, look, I think the Warriors obviously got a couple of guys out, uh, Curran notably, uh, with the COVID protocols. We're going to talk about 
uh, Nathan Cleary a little bit later in the podcast, but I was surprised to see Cody Nicarima ridiculously high uh, in terms of his average. Um, I can't believe that I think it's 69 uh, averaging. So given he's one of the very, very few players, gun type players that play 17 in the halves, um, he's a surprising option. And it seems that he's kind of going to be the half to partner with Chad Townsend for the run home, given uh, that he was named to partner him now. Uh, Roger Tuivasa Sheks uh, got the fullback role. Um, I think at this point, we all need to acknowledge that's really a draft option rather than a classic option for the run home, given where fullback is at the moment. Uh, Adam Fanua Blake is in that kind of option range uh, for Fords there. I think we've all anticipated that he would have um, you know, done it a little bit better than he has, but that seems to be the way for the really big middle Fords this year that, you know, super coach isn't really being that friendly to them uh, at the moment. Toe Harris is a must if you don't already have him. I'd find it hard to believe you're serious if you're not going to use your mega trade week to bring him in. Um, and otherwise for the Dragons, Ben Hunt um, is, I guess, a, a possibility for your Cleary uh, money if you want to move him on, um, but obviously doesn't play around 17 and not a lot else of uh, particular interest there uh, for mine with the Dragons. It, any Dragons jumped out of you, mate? <laughs> Not really. I mean, there is obviously the chat about Jack DeBellin, but couldn't really go there. Yeah, not just for specific reasons. Just, uh, <laughs> I just don't think I could handle looking at him in my team. But mm-hmm. that's another story there. But look, Josh McGuire and also Fui Mayono back, bloody Tyrell, um, back from suspension themselves. So that muddies, muddies those middle forward minutes there for sure with the four forward bench. The only thing I will say with Fanua Blake, uh, just back to the Warriors real quick. I mean, if you're going to get him at 418,000, 66 break even, and playing round 17 next week, I think this is pretty much the week you got to jump on. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere price-wise if you want to look at him for another week and consider him next week, but I reckon there's better options you might want to hold off on and wait for round 17 to, to grab. Uh, you know, for example, if there's Origin uh, as a consideration there that you might want to, you know, and I spoke, we, I guess we kind of spoke about it last, uh, last episode where Daniel Tupo, I think, is almost like the perfect round 17 guy that you hold off and wait for. But, uh, yeah, look, I'd be avoiding pretty much everyone uh, from the Dragons. I mean, Jack Bird, again, still getting that, you know, it looked like he was getting that 80-minute roll for a bit. Now he's back in the centre. So uh, if you jumped on, that's a bit rough, and maybe you're going to have to move him on. If you stayed off him, then good thing that you waited for a little bit longer because, uh, surprise, surprise, back to the back line for him as well. And DWZ playing his first game for the Warriors. He's, you know, as a Bulldogs fan the last few years, uh, he's flashed at times, but I assure you he's a trap, which has, you know, been the the lot of a lot of uh, Warriors wingers over the years, um, you know, that they'll flash and, and entice a few owners in and, and ultimately disappoint them. So I would definitely avoid. Um, the other blockbuster, Wilf, though, is the Friday night game, Panthers-Eels. No Cleary, of course, but plenty of guns on both sides. Yeah, so you know, we'll, we'll definitely talk a little bit with Mike Cleary in detail in the strategy section because I think it's a huge talking point this week. But with Luai named to back up and Burton's going to play 5-8 beside him, we've only seen that combination once. And Luai played on the right side with Burton staying on the left, which I think is a little bit relevant there just in terms of the ongoing combinations that they'll have. I just think um, you know we've seen how potent that left edge is with Kikau and then Crichton and obviously Visa uh, on the left as well. And I kind of think it would have been better for Luai to stay on that side because it just doesn't seem as uh, appealing when he's working with Cape Well, Tyrone May and, uh, well, what what will be Brett Naden this week and probably Charlie Staines uh, once Dylan Edward is back from his injury. So, yeah, that's something to keep in mind for Luai owners. I think you've got to give him a, a week to have a look, but it's not a great matchup either way. So it's not ideal. For Burton owners, I think you've got to sit and wait for a little bit longer. Yeah, again, not ideal this week with the relatively tough matchup against the pretty much the full-strength Eels, uh, minus Reed Marnie. And then he obviously doesn't play round 17 and round 18 again. Who knows when Cleary's actually back. So it's a tough one. I think you'd give him the week and then wait and see in case the, the news isn't great or Cleary. But uh, I wouldn't be locking him in for the season because if he does go back, to the centers, then I'd be wondering, you know, is this the best setup moving forward for your half halves position, given, you know, round 17 coverage, given whether you want to get the likes of Sean Johnson or Nick Arima in there as well. 
Has Crichton been confirmed to switch back to left centre? Yeah, look, that's a good point. I'm assuming he is, but given, I mean, Tyrone May has often played right centre. Last year he did from memory, so that's kind of why I expected Stephen to move back to the left. Mm -hmm. But you're right, it could end up being Crichton moving back to the right side, which, you know, it kind of was better for Staines when that happened. But surely (laughs) if you still got him, then, you know, you'll see how he goes as a fullback, which is actually meant to be his main position. But he is surely a, a prime target to be traded out this week or next anyway. Very much. And I also think that Mitchell Moses will be 100% licking his lips. This is an origin audition for him uh, with Cleary out. And I think he might have some specials for Charlie Staines, who is on the shorter side. Um, I do foresee one of the, you know, the Zach, is it Chinny, Sinny? Uh, you know, that, that rookie from earlier um, on whose second game for the Tigers was an absolute nightmare under the high ball. So, look, hopefully for Charlie Staines' owners it works out, but I do foresee uh, his height being used against him there as well. Um, obviously, the back row for the Eels, very highly owned players with Papali'i and Madison there. You've got to think with Sean Lane and Bryce Cartwright on the bench that that one of the two will play their usual kind of 55, 60 minutes. It's just hard to pick which one, isn't it? Yeah, and I just think with the way Madison is, it seems like the last couple of weeks he's been the one who's been favoured to have the early shower uh, and be protected a little. Uh, so given the work rate for Papa Lee, I think he's the one you'd want to keep for sure, especially since he's got the dual position available at front row forward. I think Maddo is genuinely a sell if you need to. Uh, I think a lot of people are considering it. Yeah, five five hundred and ten k break even of ninety five. Um, you know, a lot of people have both Madison and Barnett, and I've had a few questions uh, in social media and in various chats about who would be the priority sell. I've got both, and and I just think with Barnett named on that edge, uh, and. I think his scoring potential is better given he's pretty much guaranteed 80. So Mano would be the trade out personally for me uh, beforehand. Any other eels? Uh, obviously, Gutho there. We've talked off air uh, before we started recording about whether Gutherson's a hold. Um, but I would imagine if you know, all the non turbo owners would want to prioritize moving Gutho on for him. Yeah, look, I think it's not a question there. I think if you've got Gutho and not turbo, he's a really easy option to sell on. Given, I mean, I don't think the Panthers will fall in a heap just because they're missing Cleary and they still got most of their origin stars backing up here. So I do think the Panthers will, will give a much better account of themselves, even without Cleary. So yeah, I think Gutho is a prime sell target. I expect a lower score from him this week. And you know, for the run home, uh, as you said, we talked about it. I think the Eels have a tougher run home than it looks. And I think, especially for Gutho, you're, you're going to want rather a Turbo or a Pappenhausen in the back end of the season, or even a Ponga, given the easy night's run home that we talked about multiple times, usually in reference to Bradman Best, but <laughs> I'd remind you of that one there, Joe. Who I still have in my team. I have not yet traded him out, but we'll see. Um, speaking of lowered expectations and lowered scores, the Bulldogs game is next up. Uh, they're playing the Seagulls. Tommy Turbo, if he does play, could do absolutely anything this game. And I suppose you'd pretty much say the same for Ruben Garrick as well. I definitely think given, like, I mean, not to disparage the Bulldogs any more than we normally do, but I have to say for a Bulldogs team, even this looks worse than normal. Like Carl Flanagan's back. They've got one, two, three different rookies and, like, uh, they've got Jackson Tupini back as well, who's he's played a couple of games, but... Yeah, it's not very much experience in this lineup, especially with the COVID breaches from a few uh, not so smart Bulldogs players. But yeah, that on top of obviously the Seagulls being relatively full strength based on what they've named, minus um, Jake Turbo, obviously, and still no sign of Josh Schuster. And outside of that, honestly, I think this, as you're right, it, it could get pretty ugly. Yeah, eight or nine uh, players out for the Bulldogs, and even then. Uh, high-priced Melbourne Storm signing Joe Stimson can only make the interchange. So make of that what you will. Um, Not a lot of interest despite them playing round 17 on the side. I did start with Josh Josh Jackson earlier in the year um, and he did make a little bit of cash and and flash some point-scoring ability there, but there's just no attacking stats pretty much across the board for the Bulldogs, much less for Josh Jackson there. Marty Tapao, a bit of an interesting uh, front row option there. We talked about uh, for Noah Blake before. Obviously, Takiaho is in, uh, I think, 399. 
So, you know, definitely underpriced for what you'd expect, but Marty Tapao are uh, doing better than both. A little bit more expensive, but certainly an option. And we know he can get those attacking stats, right? Because there's every chance he crashes over or he, you know, pulls out a nice offload and someone runs off that and gets over the line. So definitely like the up, uh, attacking upside of Tapao, but you're going to pay a fair bit of extra coin for that when you've got some you know, cheaper and pretty safe options in the likes of Takeaho and Fanua Blake. We've talked about Luke Thompson. He's another definite option there with the dual position too and the round 17 coverage. But especially this week, there's a good chance Thompson just spends 30 minutes watching goals. Go to the- he, yeah, he could. I think he'll play a lot of big minutes just given how many uh, players are out for the Bulldogs as well. But what we did see was that, you know, with Josh Jackson back, uh, when Napa and Hetherington uh, are on the field as well in that middle rotation, that his minutes did drop. Um, I think his appeal kind of midway through the season was he was playing that 55, 60 minutes, and I just don't think once. And it's really only uh, Napa to come back uh, into the side um, that he'll be able to sustain that, and, and that does kind of present a bit of a problem. Hopefully uh, for owners, he can keep his minutes up for this week in round 17. But I think um, it's a little bit far-fetched to suggest that he's someone that you can run in your top kind of 18 or 19 for the run home. Yeah, purely depth option. Now, two other names I want to really quickly touch on. Um, so like I mentioned, Jackson Tupany starting this week. Obviously, Adam Elliott is out injured. I think he's looking at four to six weeks from memory. And if that's the case, then, you know, if, if Jackson is starting there for a couple of weeks and then, I mean, there's a chance he goes back to the bench. He, he plays that utility role, um, either playing in the back row, which is his natural position, or playing backup hooker to Marshall King potentially. I kind of wonder, uh, you know, is he a bit of a trap or is he fine if you've got the trades to move him on once Elliot's back? I, I think the issue is that, you would need to want to have the trades uh, to to move him on, you know, once the team comes back. And, and look, he may just drop completely out of the side. Who knows with the way Trent Barrett's chopping and changing of late. Um, I guess the challenge is what is his point scoring potential because unlikely that there's much in the way of attacking stats, as I said, for the Bulldogs before. And if you're looking for a kind of mid to late season cash cow, if you're paying 226 for one, you'd hope that their break even was kind of negative 30 or 40. Well, it's already four. Um, you know, he's only averaged 39 in his four games and, and you know, a couple off the bench, but he has played big minutes and a couple of the other ones. So I just do wonder, you're not bringing him into play him unless it's for round 17. It might get to 30 points, you know, and you might have to move him on in kind of four weeks for a $40,000 gain i'm just not sure you know even though i'm a bulldog supporter and i'd love to have more of them in my side um you know what the play is there i guess it's just you know, there is some potential i think you know it, what we've seen of him mostly is is him playing at hooker and edge back row is his actual position i mean he was captain of the australian school boys um in, in recent years so he's definitely a promising talent so it's just about whether he can deliver. And I think based on what we've seen of him, he's very willing to get stuck in and make his tackles. So I imagine, I'm not saying that he could be, but you know that's one of the really good things about Angus Crichton's game, that he, even though he's an edge back rower, he loves to get stuck in, make 25, 30, 35 tackles, even on the edge. And I wonder if, if Tupini can do that, then he could definitely give some solid depth scores for a couple of weeks. And I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up holding down an edge spot given his competition as Matt Dury and Chris Smith and I guess Adam Elliott will, will definitely take one of those spots. Hey, hey, it. hey, high-priced Melbourne Storm signing, Joe Stimson. Who's named behind Tiffany and <laughs> Rudd. <laughs> you beauty. Yeah. Thanks, Craig Bellamy. <laughs> Jeremy Marshall King is the last name I do have to mention. He's getting a little bit of hype just because he's played two minutes, sorry, two games of 80 minutes in the last couple of weeks and scored quite well. He had a 75 and a 66, and you know obviously the 75 did have a try with the line break in there. But even with that, that it's still pretty pretty decent. You know, let's say 50 to 55 ish in base and base attack. I mean, if you're really scratching at hooker and you really want to ditch one of these guys, you could do worse, couldn't you? I mean, the, the problem is he's priced at 447 already, which is exactly what Jaden Braley's priced at, and. I mean, both 80-minute players potentially. Um, Braley's proven he can 
you know, sniff out a try and a line break, I think far more effectively than Marshall King and and the Knights have a lot more points in them. So I certainly wouldn't be moving Braley uh, on for Marshall King given, you know, what my trade situation is and what pretty much everyone's trade situation is. What I guess who would be the the person you'd move out for Marshall? I mean, I, I probably wouldn't personally. I, I'm not that keen myself, but let's say if you had like a Jake Simpkin stuck there and you wanted to move him on, because this is the round to do it, to clear out your dead wood and you don't really know what, you know, you don't have the dual positions to do much with him. He probably isn't the worst option. And especially if you've got some trades left to maybe turn him into Harry Grant later if he needed to. I kind of think that could be a viable play. But yeah, like for me, it's not an option, but I can certainly see why some people would be interested. Uh, definitely if you've max traded. I mean, if you got stuck with him for the rest of the season, it's probably not the end of the world, honestly. If he's holding down that main hooking role, uh, whether it's playing 80 or even if he drops back to, you know, 60, 65 minutes, whatever, he's still probably going to give you 40 points minimum, and that's not an AU nightmare. Yeah, true, but, I mean, he is the same price as Carl Lawton. Uh, it's only 20k to Josh Hodson, um, both of whom will play 17 as well. So I'd probably put him a little bit back in the pack, but, yeah, if, if you're really chasing pods and, and do believe in the Bulldogs, then, yes, he could be, uh, uh, I guess, a decent enough option as well. But we've spoken way too much about the Bulldogs, mate. Raiders-Titans for the uh, third game on Saturday. Uh, Brimson's back for the Titans, which is always handy. Corey Thompson's a huge in, and he could be an intriguing pod for the run home given how well he scored earlier in the year. Yeah, but do you find the Titans are just going backwards slowly? Like they just seem to get worse each week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fafita almost seems a shell of the player he was in the opening month of the season. I mean, he's still really great for super coach, right? Because he's still doing those really nice crabbing runs that don't do anything for your team, but scores about eight super coach points because he's busted a tackle or two on the way there. But yeah, look, I, I am a little bit worried for the Titans players. Thankfully, I only have uh, Fafita in my team, but I'm not really running out there to trade in more, not until the Titans get their stuff sorted and work out what they're actually going to do in their attack. Yeah, I'm not going to look at Corey Thompson. Definitely not Not until they've worked out what's going on there. Uh, so just to note, obviously, Greg Marzu uh, not dropped. Uh, we believe he's got an elbow injury, and uh, that's the reason he's not in the team. He might be back around 18. We'll have to see. But you'd imagine there's a chance that he could, I don't know, unseat Philip Sammy for that r- other wing. Maybe. I mean, and, and obviously Anthony Don is kind of floating there and thereabouts as well. I think he's kind of returning from an injury as well. So, you know, he, they're definitely all behind Thompson. Um, so really, Marshu is one of, you know, three people that could be on that wing. I, I don't know whether you hold on to him in the hope that, that he jags that spot or not again, given that we've got the five trades this week and, and we can, you know, take the opportunity to do some major surgery on the team. Yeah, that's a tough decision I've got to work out. He's on the list of potential trade-outs for me, even though I'd hoped to be able to use him. But it's just because I've had to potentially rejig my trades. Uh, but we'll come to that in a bit. On the Raiders side, I mean, what's your thoughts on Bailey Simmonson? We saw him you know, tear up the Broncos, and then we saw him come back crashing to earth a little bit uh, in the week after with no attacking stats. But he still had a pretty decent base, and that's, I think, the main thing, isn't it? 39 and 80 minutes, but 43 in base and base attack. He had a couple of negative stats there and errors and whatnot. But yeah, I'm wondering like if he's going to give you 35 to 40 at 385,000 and with potential to keep playing fullback for the rest of the season, would you consider getting him back in if you trade him in out? Oh, I, I think that you throw out any kind of reference to fullback scoring against the Broncos, mate. I mean, there's no doubt that, um, you know, fullbacks do really well against the Broncos. And guess what? Simonson did really well against the Broncos. And then he came crashing back to earth, um, you know, with the 39 uh, in 80 minutes the week after. So, look, I I just don't particularly believe in the talent. Um, You know, I, like just about everyone else, started with him at, you know, pretty much on 200K uh, in the hope that he jagged a try. uh, In the early weeks, he didn't. um, Moved him on when most did. But, um, you know, people that held, I guess, are being rewarded, but I don't see um, him being an actual trade-in per se just because, you know, he could go back to that kind of 80-minute, 24-point-a-game, you know, winger, 
you know, in three or four weeks and then you're kind of stuck with not quite an AE nightmare, but, you know, it's, it, it's pretty suboptimal given that um, you, everyone's going to try and, you know, do the loophole in the last few weeks of the year and, you know, he's pretty bolted on for 25 points or 24 points uh, in a game because he's, he wasn't, you know, scoring. They weren't coming left at all. Yeah. Look, I think I agree with you. The Titans are not great against fullbacks either. I mean, we obviously saw what Tommy Turbo did to them um, <laughs> last week. And then the, the game before that was Joey Manu going for 97. So there's been a few decent fullback scores against the Titans, but I think it's safe to say Turbo and Manu uh, are probably some of the better fullbacks and a fair bit more talented than the likes of Bailey Simonson. So I wouldn't get sucked in either. You know who else is bad against fullbacks, mate? Queensland, particularly when they play when the other side plays three of them. Uh, yeah. not, not not so good. <laughs> my my memory is coming back. Yeah, unfortunately, it seemed like those three really did torment the whole Queensland backline and some of the forwards too. Yeah, um, but just closing this game out, mate. Hodgson is, I guess, not a, an ideal option, but at three hundred and sixty nine k, so he does play around seventeen. So. If you're looking to shake things up at hooker, he's an option. Corey Harawir and Naira, I think he's largely made his money and, and he's shown that he is a little bit too dependent on attacking stats to to score a, a kind of acceptable uh, score, um, you know, given he's got tries and line breaks and still only kind of busted out mid-50s, which for an 80-minute back rower probably doesn't do the business um, for you. He's a hold, I think, if you've got him, but but certainly not someone I'd be looking to buy playing round 17. So Saturday night game, Knights-Cowboys headlined by the return of Kalen Ponga. You did mention that they've got a fantastic run home. I guess they don't play uh, next week's buy round, but, uh, you know, the Cowboys have been a pretty soft touch to outside backs of late. Yeah, the only downside with Ponga is with the Clifford move, it sounds like Clifford's going to be the goal kicker, so that does take a bit of shine off him. Having said that, even if you look at Ponga's scores without goal kicking, he could, you know, still average really well. It's just he's not going to – I just don't see him being able to match Turbo or Pappenhausen even with, you know, an easier draw. So that is one downside there. Obviously, if if Ponga gets the kicking in, then he definitely jumps up a little bit more. Obviously, I I traded him in early in the season, so I do believe in the scoring of Ponga, but that was when he was still goal kicking. So, yeah, I'm not – I'm not – I'm not wedded to the idea of getting Ponga in over a Pappenhausen or a Turbo late in the season, but he's certainly a, a real port option given how, I mean, Broncos twice in, in five games, I think, is what the Knights have. So I can't argue with wanting to take a take a punt on Ponga, especially if you need to differentiate yourself from someone up the top end as a bit of a pod, but that's more of a late round, you know, throw out the stumps situation there. Yeah, but I mean, let's let let's be clear about Ponga. Um, you know, he came back right as the Knights had started to struggle after a decent start. The blokes averaging, you know, we've talked up Nico Hines, we've talked up Gutho. Teddy had a blistering start to the year, even though he's cooled off a little bit. Kalen Ponga is averaging all more than all of those guys. He's got the second highest average at fullback, averaging eighty seven. Uh, obviously, well behind Tommy Turbo, but everyone is. I mean, look. You know, yes, you can take away the goal kicking, but you'll recall that they didn't kick that many goals when, you know, in the weeks that he did play before he got hurt again. So, I mean, I think he's a premium option regardless. It's just that, you know, you just have to pick the right time. And and if people are looking at a pod, 1.3% ownership, uh, given how the Knights run home. Um, Less a trade-in option, I think, this week, but more someone I'd want to target kind of round 18. And look, that's perfectly viable. Like I said, I don't hate the option at all. I just think without the goal kicking, his upside's definitely capped and he may struggle. Like Turbo's just a freak, but the reason Pappenhausen is right up there is because he does have that extra floor from being able to kick goals for one of the best offenses in the NRL. So, you know, obviously Mitch Barnett now playing back to the edge and that might only just be till Tyson Frizzell's back, which may not be too many more rounds, but while he's there, I think he... He's shown he's able to score at a gun keeper level. Maybe a 60 to 70 average is not unheard of for the next couple of weeks. So I, I think, you know, if you've got Barnett, like I was originally going to go Barnett to Tohu to- to- Harris, no e- no issues there. But with Barnett being named on the edge, I'm tempted to kind of hold him. And, you know, up against that Cowboys pack, there's certainly some attacking stats on offer um, running at Dearden, I believe. So I'm, I'm really minded to hold him perhaps for until... Yeah, Frizzell's back. 
Yeah, and and like I said, uh, I've got both Madison and Barnett, and I'm not saying I'll move either of them necessarily, but if I do move one, uh, it'll definitely be Madison before Barnett, just given the uh, certainly the next few weeks and, and Madison's kind of projected minutes. So the next game, uh, first up on Sunday, Broncos Sharks, mate. I, I swear to God, I, I knew I held Tessie new week after week after week knowing that eventually he'd get back in the side and probably at fullback. Uh, and, you know, knowing my luck, he'll probably start scoring well. Of course, I sold him the, uh, about a day before he got named uh, as an emergency play in fullback and he's held the spot. Yeah, but he didn't really score that well. I and mean, I can't see it getting too much better unless the Broncos somehow magically become a better team, which um, it will require some magic. So I'm not, I don't think you should beat yourself up on that one, honestly. <laughs> He's, I thought he was the next Darren Lockyer, though, mate. Well, we know Darren Lockyer wasn't that good for Supercoach either. So <laughs> on that note, uh, Katoni Staggs, who is pretty good for Supercoach, he's back. Um, obviously can't jump on sight and seen. And, you know, there's still whispers that he might get a shot in the halves before the end of the season, given he wants to play 5-8. And that'll be a, a, a real watch, I think. It'll be interesting to see how he goes there. But uh, I guess for the Broncos, it's good that they get him back because he's obviously one of their better players. But Brody Croft is back in the team too, so I don't know if that nullifies any additional bonus we get for having Stags back in the team. And, you know, Pangai's obviously suspended. Word is he'll be out to around 20 at this stage. The Broncos say he'll stay until the end of the season, as will Matt Lodge, which I'm wondering if that takes a bit of shine off, you know, whether you hold him or not. Because, I mean, he's still going to play six, potentially, of the last 10 games, I think, that we have this season. So given how much we will need the depth. I'm wondering if he's worth holding. What are you doing with Pango? I'm holding him because he's one of the few uh, front rowers that are scoring at a kind of a gun level. I, I can't see, you know, assuming he slots straight back into that, um, you know, 80-minute edge roll, and, and he was certainly one of Brisbane's better players when he was doing that. Eligible in the front row, you know, the big men just aren't getting it done to the same level as they have in previous years. So... I think for sure he's a hold, um, you know, if you can possibly do it, just having him there kind of in your reserve front row slot and, yeah, just, just bring him back on. And I think he's a top three uh, front rower. So, yeah, I'd 100% uh, hold him, mate. Yeah, I mean, if he's staying at the Broncos, I think he's going to keep the role he's got, which is one of the forward pack leaders. So I don't really see his scoring dropping. So, yeah, I'm comfortable holding him as well now that we know he's not going anywhere. And, you know, whilst he's unsigned, I think he's going to want to put his best foot forward, be on his best behaviour so he doesn't get suspended anymore, and obviously, you know, show off his best offloading skills, uh, given that's probably one of the reasons teams like to sign him. Yeah. Be able to get that many offloads in a game. Having said that, do you load up on the Sharks? Well, I mean, they are starting to play a bit more respectably. You know, Jesse Ramian was, you know, an interesting pick in recent weeks, he's, he's a fairly high-priced uh, centre wing and, and if you're going him, you're basically, you know, backing the Sharks to uh, to continue to improve. SJ is an obvious uh, backup 5'8 or, or backup halfback uh, for the run home and, and could feasibly be someone that you'd want to spend your, your Cleary money if you move him on, um, given that he's, I think, less than half the price and, and plays that round 17. But honestly, CSC for Talakai was a little bit of a worry. I did bring him in for the last game and he didn't play that many minutes and only scored the 35. I guess his re- one redeeming feature is that he is available in centre wing, 337, but not a lot else of, of particular interest for the Sharks, mate. They just seem to be priced you know, at, at what their ability is and, and there isn't too much value there. I'm just wondering when Sione Katoa gets back from his injury. He was meant to be back weeks ago, so still a bit of an interesting one there. He he's on the extended bench, but um, who knows what that means? Yeah, well, he's on the extended bench the previous round as well, so not reading too much into that. Uh, otherwise, I mean, Ronaldo, poor Ronaldo, uh, Mulatalo is. I think he is he an option if he plays. Oh yeah, I, I guess he could be. It's it's again, um, you know, wanting to look at his ownership. I doubt that it's uh, it's particularly high, um, but he's four seventy break even of 21, um, only in 2% of teams, and he certainly does have the ability to sniff out a try as well. But average of 52, um, and he has kicked up you know, in recent times. So I don't know, he just he just seems to be priced at 
what his value is, I, I'd probably rather go, you know, 135k cheaper and go for Talakai. You get the dual flexibility option, and and Talakai obviously is a magnet for super coach stats. So that would seem to be the the highest ceiling play for me. Yeah, I can understand that, but I mean, Mulatalo since coming back from injury himself, three round, three hour, sorry, three round average of eighty four, and you know, as you said couple of tries in there i think four tries to be more precise but it's base and base attack 43 35 48 so definitely getting involved and getting a good healthy amount of tackle bus in there so i mean there's more start throws i reckon <laughs> yeah look um you could well be right does it am i right in thinking he's up against oats as well i think he's actually i mean that's the thing he's obviously played both right and left wing from memory, he was on the left side, so he might actually get to go against the soccer. I think both of those would be Doesn't a, really matter, a does it? <laughs> yeah finger licking prospect, mate. Um, you know, given their defensive woes. So, yeah, look, uh, he he very much uh, very much is an option there as well. Rami in at five thirty three, his break even's ninety nine. So if if you are a bit money conscious, he's probably going to be cheaper next week up against the uh, the Warriors in round 17. So um, a lot of people are looking to uh, to get a couple of Sharks in and mainly to not only for the reason that they play round 17, but the fact that a lot of people have uh, have stocked up on Roosters and, and there's, you know, no pods uh, playing for the Roosters at the moment. They're all pretty well owned. So it's that uh, time of year when you want to go for that contrary play and uh, the Sharks, you know, are as good an option as any, I would suggest. So uh, Sunday afternoon game, mate, West Tigers, Rabbitohs, um, a heap of super coach relevant players here, but not for necessarily all the right reasons. Dane Laurie's on the chopping block for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, if you hadn't sold him already, I'm wondering if it's worth just per- persevering with him and holding him and hoping he comes good at the back end of the season. I think we've spoken about the Knights easy draw. The, the Tigers have a pretty good one as well uh, at the back end. So I don't mind if you do want to hold at least one Tiger and have that depth option. I think a lot of people were considering it's either Laurie or Nofo, but at the same time, if you need the cash to make trades happen for round 17 and you know wanting to do it with the mega trade round, then I certainly don't have an issue selling all your Tigers. I mean, I, I sold Laurie myself, but yeah, I mean, getting to play the Broncos round 18, then you know Bulldogs, Cowboys... Sharks, Panthers, Bulldogs in round 21, 25. That's certainly not bad. And I think from memory, he turned up a couple of times against them last year. I don't know. You might remember that a bit more clearly than I do. Yeah, I, I do recall that he had a good streak against them, mate. But, um, yeah, oh, look, I don't own Nofo. I own Laurie. Um, if I owned both, I'd probably want to move Laurie on just given that you'll bank an extra 70K and, and Nofo on his day has a higher ceiling as anyone Um Adam Dway, he's back as well. Uh, I know Bear, I think, has still got him and a, a lot of owners did well out of him, but I think that the juice is pretty much out on him. I mean, just playing at centre is a, a real downside. Just doesn't get to touch the ball as much. And sure, he can still score tries and he's got a decent floor because he's always going to have that goal kicking. But yeah, I think... Break even at 154, he's probably a priority move. Yeah, I mean, I think you probably would have sold him already. I think his, his peak was about $150,000 um, ago. So he's already dropped a lot of coin and being knocked out doesn't help. So he could actually be a bit of a pot option if you want to bring him back in. Um, uh, he, he could be sub 500k and really a, a decent downgrade option for those who want to look at him in a couple of weeks' time. Possibly. Stefano Camano, uh, it's time to move him on. 363K, he's made his money. His break even's now 59, so it's all going to go south. So, uh, again, just taking advantage of the mega trade round to start to move some of the chaff uh, out of your side, and, and he's certainly that. But the uh, Rabbitohs will be much more interesting from a super coach perspective. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we've spoken about so many of the Rabbitohs already, but. Cody Walker is a fine option. Even with this Cleary injury, I just can't see Cody being the one they bring in to replace Cleary for game three. Um, as you pointed out, you think Mitch Moses is going to put forward his best audition this week and hopefully get to play Origin. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Adam Reynolds gets another go just as a one-off. Yeah, there's options there. I just don't think Cody Walker's high on the list. So I feel like you could pro- pro- probably still bring him in pretty safely. 
Um, Latrell, you know, int- intriguing pod, but while he's playing fullback and not playing round 17, I just can't see any point in bringing him in. Alex Jones is way too expensive now. You know, you missed the boat for sure. Gagai is interesting. Obviously, he's going really well and actually outpacing Johnston the last couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken. But again, he doesn't play around 17, and that's a huge reason you'd want to get some of the Rabbitohs guys. But if you reckon Gagai is going to be there for the rest of the season as one of the top four or five center wings, honestly, don't hate the idea of bringing him in. Um, as a former owner, I can tell you it's been a, it, it can be a pretty tough watch at times. But the way the Rabbitohs are starting to attack, I think there's plenty of opportunities for him to get that attacking stat. Tane Milne's not a bad downgrade if you want to have someone from the Rabbitohs and you can't necessarily afford the, the left edge. I mean, Milne scored a try the other week and you know pumped out 55-ish or thereabouts. He's got that dual position. is still quite reasonably priced, so not a bad option if you definitely need a downgrade as well. He's, he's really one of the few kind of low 200s person that's guaranteed to, to play uh, a role next week, isn't he? There just doesn't seem to be a lot else. Uh, I guess Tapane from uh, from the Bulldogs, but he's a, a bit more expensive as well. So, you know, yes, it, we've got these five trades, but you do need to uh, to kind of make the money somehow. So I guess Milne is likely to be a, a fairly popular kind of trade down to make some of those moves work. Yeah, and I mean, Matt Tomoko from the Raiders was one that plenty were banking on, but the return of Captain Croker has kind of skipped that idea. He's still on the extended bench, and if he's 18th man, and if anything happens to Sebastian Chris, I wouldn't be surprised if Tomoko comes in. And if that does happen, he wouldn't be a bad downgrade option either. The only other name I can really think of is um, Edward Kosi from the Warriors, who, whilst Ewan Aitken's out, uh, seems like he's got another opportunity I mean, whilst Reese Walsh is injured, he's in there. So he's just a shade over uh, bottom dollar because he's played a couple of games, but his base isn't great. It's just you're hoping, you know, he might give you a few points, be a good cash out option this week. And then once at Walsh and you and Aitken are back, of course, he would drop out of the side altogether. So he's probably the only other name I can think of that might play hopefully round 17 and then disappear. Yeah, definitely uh, slim pickings there. So we have pretty much talked out uh, South, you know, over the over the week. So they're all pretty known quantities uh, as far as our listeners are concerned, no doubt, Wilf. So that's the team news for the week. Uh, let's take a quick break. Hey, fellas. We are in the thick of winter and the storms are brewing. Luckily, our partners at Manscaped specialise in products to make sure you're walking around town with beautiful snowballs. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code CHAMPIONS at manscaped.com. Manscaped are here to provide you with the best tools for your grooming experience, offering precision engineered tools for your family jewels. The Manscaped Performance Package is the best buy of 2021. The Performance Package comes with a new improved Lawnmower 3.0, which is the best trimmer on the market, best hygiene tool for the modern man. You get the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, you get the performance boxer briefs and a travel bag. The bundle also comes with a crop preserver ball deodorant and a crop reviver ball toner. If you want to look good, that's upstairs and downstairs. You want to smell good, you want to feel good, you may as well use the best tools for the job. Don't get cold feet this winter. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code CHAMPIONS at manscaped.com. There's also a ton of other amazing men's hygiene products on the website. But look, don't take my word for it. Give it a go. Jump on the website, 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using the code CHAMPIONS. Again, that's 20% off, free shipping at manscaped.com using the code CHAMPIONS. Thank you again to Manscaped for making our winter wieners look so good. If you are what you say you are, a superstar, then have no fear, the camera's here. All right, so we've already done Swish for this week, but I just thought it'd be good to really quickly recap and, uh, you know, we unfortunately haven't gotten Bear's answer, but to be fair, he's been pretty busy. So we'll forgive him for that one. Thanks to did chime in with Cody Walker um, on the earlier episode. You picked RTS and I picked Tommy Turbo. So those are our Swish predictions at the moment. But look, I was provided a bit of a message and this is a timely one for you and I in particular, Joe. So here we go. 
Hey champions, firstly, I just wanted to say thanks for being such big supporters of me, especially Bear, who keeps telling everyone that I'm the best player for Supercoach in the game. And it turns out he's the only one with me and his Supercoach team. So Joe Fitz, Cat Fitz, what are you guys even doing? Haven't I shown you both how good I am already? And your Supercoach rankings show how clueless you both are. Get it right. Trade me into your teams already and thank me later. Otherwise, watch your season get even worse, especially you, Catfish. All the best, guys. Have a good one. I mean, it's fantastic that we managed to uh, to have him give us a shout-out, Wilf, but uh, Turbo can G and GF after Sunday night's performance as far as I'm concerned. Look, he had a quiet game, all right? He already did less than normal. So, yeah, he's he's done enough to my team for this season. Well, not to my team necessarily, just to everyone else's team, uh, mine not included. So, look, to be fair, I've picked him for 170 this week, so I will be getting him in this week finally. I'm listening, Tommy, okay? I'll be getting you in just in time to play my Bulldogs, Tommy. So, yeah, win-win or lose-lose. So, yeah, that's obviously an example again of what kind of content you can grab from Swish. Uh, jump on their website, heyswish.com. Yeah, we'll, we'll tweet out the actual videos so you can see what that's like. But obviously, yeah, it's good fun. I can imagine some head-to-head finals at the back end of the season. You know, imagine being able to get Tommy to trash talk your opponent who didn't captain him or, you know, you can jump on the likes of Nathan Cleary or James Tedesco or Ryan Pappenhausen, as you've seen uh, from a couple of videos we've had uh, provided so far. So thanks again to Swish for that. And, yeah, make sure you check them out. And don't forget the promo code CHAMP, C-H-A-M-P. You'll get an extra 10% off any order on the website. So having said that, that's enough Swish. Let's talk strategy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. All right. So the clear and present priority for all of us uh, who own Cleary is to sell or not, mate. Um, obviously, a lot of rumours going around about how much damage uh, has actually uh, occurred to that shoulder, but uh, we're in a chat with Trent Copeland and he's pretty uh, firm on trading him out. He, he said, torn labrum, dislocated shoulder and a fracture in the joint. You can't jab that. So what do you reckon, mate? He's pretty much a trade out, isn't he? Yeah, I think I'm with Trent on that one. And to be honest, even without knowing all of that information, I was leaning towards trading him. I think given his price tag, like one million and sixty six thousand, it's just way too long, to, to way too much to keep on your bench when there's the uncertainty of an injury that you don't know how long he'll be gone for. My experiences of holding Brian Papsenhausen is a perfect example of what can go wrong when you try to hold someone like that. Obviously, if you are short on trades, and that's a, a real big determining factor here, if you've max traded. I can imagine it'd be really tough for you to be able to get Cleary back in unless you're incredibly disciplined and you don't use any of the cash that you basically free up by trading him in out. But, you know, we talked about Sean Johnson. You can go Cleary to Johnson and free up $600,000, which is insane. It's ridiculous how much money you can get from doing that. So I am definitely looking at that. It was one of my five trades this week and it just makes everything else more viable. Now, I've, I've only sold, saved a handful of trades. So for me, I've had to make adjustments to my final team if I'm going to do this because I'm going to need a trade at least to get Cleary back in. So that's something I'm kind of wrestling with at the moment. But it may mean the likes of, say, Mitch Barnett now becomes a keeper for the season, even though I would you know had full plans of trading him out to Tohu Harris uh, even if he's not on the edge in a couple of weeks' time when Frizz is back, I may still just have to hold Barnett because I don't have the spare trade to get him out. And worst case scenario, if Barnett's there plotting away for 45.50 average on my bench, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, it's a fair emergency option there, mate. It's a, The biggest challenge for me is not whether I'm going to trade Cleary out. I think that, uh, that decision's been made with the severity of the injury. I think it's just picking the right person. Jerome Hughes has obviously had a whale of a season. He's averaging 75, but can blow hot and cold and doesn't play round 17. Um, you know, I have held Sam Walker, but I'd say that there'd be a fair few uh, super coaches out there that would be pondering whether or not to bring him back in given that he's got a... You know, we know he's got a ceiling of a, of 170 because he's scored that much. Um, 496k, uh, but he is highly owned. Cody Walker as well, 590. If you've got the uh, the flexibility to to swap 
Cleary out for a 5'8", but Cody Nikarim is really the one that at 5'58", plays round 17 as well. It's owned by less than 10% of people uh, and periodically gets the goal kicking. It seems that, you know, he only kind of gets it sometimes. It, it, is Nikarim of any real interest? I mean, it's certainly an option. I think we talked about it a bit, considering him versus SJ in previous weeks, but I lean SJ because we know he does get that goal kicking and... With Nikarima, I just don't know how the introduction of Chad Townsend is going to affect that. Not that there's much correlation, but I think with SJ, since Chad has been out of the team, he and Moylan have been combining better and SJ scored better as a result. You know, is, is Chad Townsend the handbrake that's going to stunt the Warriors' attack and blunt some of Nikarima's effectiveness? I don't know. And that's the big unknown here. You, He's had a cracking season so far. He's been goal-kicking, but does the Chad put a stop to that does the chad kick goals instead i don't know like there's so many question marks there that just make me think yeah, i'd rather not roll the dice on that i'd rather trust you know a proven super coach gun albeit one who's slowing down and does have his own injury concerns but sj at 513,000 seems like a safer option to me Look, he is, but but how much of the decision uh, to think favourably on Sean Johnson is because we're remembering all the good times of previous years. He's he's certainly a, an intelligent player, and and what he's lost, you know, in speed, he's kind of making up uh, by making smart plays. But the but the fact of the matter is, in Super Coach, he's only the twenty fourth highest scoring uh, halfback or five eighth. So. Yes, he's had a bit of an uptick in recent weeks, but not that much of an uptake, uh, uptick. The guy's only averaging uh, at 53, which, you know, is less than Chad Townsend. It's less than Scott Drinkwater, Dylan Brown, Corey Norman, Jamal Fogarty, Luke Brooks. I mean, these guys are plotters and SJ scoring less than them. So, you know, how much of a serious option? You know, I, I do have to wonder at that. But that being said, I do have Tyson Gamble as my backup 5'8", so SJ might actually get a guarantee this week. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, that, that average does include a game against the Storm and two games against the Panthers, which is always tough. And you know, there was the injury in there as well. So with the three eight-round average of 69.7 and those three rounds also when he got the goal kicking as well, I just think it, it shows that uh, the things are trending in the right direction. You know, He's been back from his injury in, uh, for a while now and he's... To me, anyway, he looks like he's still doing all right. He's not physically uh, hindered by that foot, by that Achilles injury that he's back from. So with the matchup against the Broncos and the Sharks, honestly, have a pretty good draw for the rest of the season with you know the Warriors, like I said, the revenge game there and the Bulldogs round 19 and the Warriors again in round 21, the Knights, Tigers, Broncos in 22, 23, 24, before he, he does have to finish up against the Storm, but... Surely just resting him anyway. And who knows? It could be the round 20 storm from last year where, you know, the likes of Matt Dufty and Zach Lomas went off absolutely bananas because the storm rested half their team. So I'm, I'm pretty sold on SJ myself, but I can certainly understand some people having some hesitation there. Did you hold Sam Walker? I did. Okay. So if the option was one of them and, and not both, would, you know, Sam Walker's cheaper than SJ? He is, but he's also have... He also has a pretty brutal matchup this week. And it's not like Sam Walker doesn't have injury concerns of his own. You know, he literally just came off missing last week to rest his um, AC joint effectively. And he's got two bad shoulders now from what I understand. And I wouldn't be surprised if come end of season, he's off to get some surgery himself. So to me, as much as the Roosters need him and they want him to play so that he can have a crack at top four, I just kind of think they're also not going to put him at risk for the future uh, long-term, given he's their long-term halfback once Kiri, Kiri moves on in a couple of years' time. You know you know who else is scoring way better than Sean Johnson? <laughs> Albert uh, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Who's injured. He's done his hammy again or something like that, apparently. I saw something on, on the Twitter sphere re- previously. I think the Broncos had a hard training session. Apparently, half the team got injured as a result. So... Well, at the age, you know, with Albert Kelly and Carmichael Hunt running around, mate, you've got to uh, you've got to ice them up real good. Nice soft training sessions for those old blokes. Yeah, that's probably 
you know, they've probably translated the soft training sessions to a lot of other areas too, unfortunately, but <laughs> soft tackling, soft everything for the, uh, for the Bronx. So, all right. So there are our Cleary options, mate. We do have a week to go before the buy round. So it is a little bit tricky, the placement of this mega trade round. We've talked a bit before about, you know, strategies for 17 in recent weeks. So we don't necessarily need to go over that ground again. But but how are you looking to maximise your trades to, for both your final team and to kind of look at numbers for 17 as well? How are you balancing that? Yeah, so I mean, I think I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now, but I'm looking at this to try clear out my dead wood and set up my team for the run home. But in doing so, I'm also planning out, you know, this week's trades, round 17, 18, 19. I know exactly with some wriggle room for, for, for adjusting to what's happening on the field and injuries and things like that but i'm almost i've got a plan basically for uh, potential trades from around 16 to 20 effectively and now that i'm committing to trading out cleary one thing i'm very conscious of is if he's back in say four weeks five weeks six weeks i'm immediately ready with a set of trades to get him back in so whether that's making sure i've got the cash there sitting in the bank so that i can do enough out of someone and then you know say Schuster or Sam Walker or someone like that straight up to Cleary in one trade or a pair of trades and just making sure I've got that on hand to get him back in. Because if he's playing, like the Panthers aren't going to be silly with him. If he's playing, he's playing because he's fit and ready to go for the for the run home, plus obviously the postseason where you'd argue that right now the Panthers are a genuine shot to be there to, to win the premiership. So I think uh, for that reason, you need to be prepared to get Cleary at any round that is available and that may mean adjusting your trades to reflect that if you are going to trade them out yeah and I think you know we've been saying it and bear probably more vocal than the two of us saying that money just isn't an issue this year I think that there is an element of truth to that but at the same point getting some of these players in is going to cost a lot of money so money is still a bit of a factor you know we, I think we're past the uh, the point of getting cash cows for the year but but just making sure you've got players in that kind of four five hundred range that are kind of not essential to your strategy so you can downgrade them uh, for a necessary upgrade whether that's Pappenhausen when he returns or or Cleary in particular. So that's really, you know, just making sure you use what's in your kitty smartly and not kind of wasting it on the way home along with your trades as well is probably my tip. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. It's just making sure at the end of the day, you know, you're balancing the number of trades you have plus, you know, how many people are you going to have for your final squad? So, you know, we've talked about not having too many enoughs and I still stand by that. And, you know, looking at my team, I'm probably going to have Ben Turbo all year. Uh, so, you know, I've had a Turbo for a long time. Unfortunately, he's been the wrong one. But, you know, he's got the dual position, so he's handy. I'm hopeful once the Seagulls are back to full strength that Turbo does, sorry, Ben Turbo drops out again and he becomes enough and just one I can use to, to potentially uh, make any last-minute trades if I have to just due to injuries. But outside of that, you know, I'm... The only other player that's probably not going to be active for me is maybe like a whoever I trade Spencer Lenier to, <laughs> even if mm. that's you know I, I might end up getting Jackson Tupany as a buy coverage option as a, as well as a downgrade option to free up as much coin as possible. And if he drops out, if he drops out, that that's ideal. If he doesn't, then maybe I'll be using him as one of my final trade options to cull to get cash for my last couple of trades there. So. Yeah, it's it's about finding that balance, I think. And overall, I mean, I'm looking at my team and short of getting Cleary back now that I've traded him out and I'm going to get Turbo this week. I'm holding Pappenhausen, so fingers crossed. Come round 18, 19, that's the run home uh, setup. I've already got ready to go. I probably only need to just grab Val Holmes after Origin with his 133 break even this week. I can't see him hitting that and he'll probably uh, have a little bit of a quieter game this week and then maybe around 18 or 19, depends when he plays next after game three. So post-Origin, it's it's Holmes, it's Grant and Cleary for me and anyone else I've already got. So that's kind of how I'm looking at my team and just mapping out my trades to make that happen. It's just that inevitable injuries, just having that handful, uh, and it can't be much more given our trade situation, um, just that handful of trades in your back pocket for the last you know, five, six weeks, 
really are just going to have to be injury replacements. There's no real um, real strategy involved in swapping players out, particularly for a run home or not. You, you're just purely going to have to save them for injuries and suspensions given that you know both of those things, injuries and suspensions, tend to be a little bit more prevalent later in the year. So, look, really great advice, Wilf. I think you know we've covered a lot of it in detail, except you went through your, some of your trade-outs. Who were you looking at getting in this week? So most likely I'm going to be getting in, yeah, so Turbo, Garrick, SJ, Torhu, Harris, and Tupany at this stage are probably my five trades. And I'm going all out because I'm, like I've spoken about, hitting round 17 as hard as I can just to try and make up as much ground as I possibly can in the next couple of weeks. And then I'll be, you know, holding on for dear life. I'll only have, like you said, a handful of trades, literally. I'll be in, um, you know, on one hand, I can count the trades I'll have left come round 18 and I'll have to see how I go. But I'll have a squad of about 22, 23 players, and I think I'll have to just, yeah, cross my fingers and pray. For me, it's uh, Gamble, Gutho, Uta Kamano, and probably Bradman best out finally. Turbo's a definite in. SJ, I guess, is a probable. I know I was talking him down beforehand, but you know some of the 5-8 options leave a bit to be desired, and I think you know, SJ is probably a good backup to Cody Walker for the run home. But the other options are really, really open. You know, I'll have TPJ on that front row bench with Papa Lee and TKO there, which I'm happy with for a few weeks, and it's really just a matter of um, you know what can I live with while still maintaining that flexibility with uh, with the trades for the run home. So probably punting on seventeen as I've said in recent weeks, um, in the hope that I can kind of keep the uh, keep the team together all the way through with that little bit of extra trades and and not carry that extra dead weight like the the Topanese, um, like you've said. But interesting to see which way uh, each of our strategies play out. Yeah, well, again, we're, we're trading from different positions, so I think that's why I've gone a different way. If I was in a more favourable position, I think I'd lean towards what you're doing, definitely. <laughs> so, unfortunately, not quite in a position to do that. I mean, the other trend I was considering, if I don't grab Jackson Tupin, is maybe looking at a Pangai to Fanua Blake to give me an extra, you know, a stronger option for round 17. That, again, could still hold for the rest of the season. But, you know, I'm, I'm leaning towards trying to keep Pangai if I can, but... That's effectively where I I'm sitting at the moment. So it's a tough it's a tough round. Obviously, one thing I will definitely recommend is as much as you can just practice your trades. Actually, looking to see when you can make them as late as possible, and how many you can make at a certain point. And you know, if there's ever a round where you can try out the trade loophole, it's this one because you got five trades to play with. You can always keep one of those trades spare and not lock in and use all five until as late as possible. So, you know, I guess one example that you're looking at uh, that we're having a kind of a consideration about for you, Joe, is that you were thinking whether you're going to trade Gutho or uh, trade Teddy to Turbo, both who play before him. And, you know, if there's a chance that Turbo doesn't play, you know, let's say he wakes up on Saturday morning, he's a bit sore than he thought, and he opts not to play that round, then if you got you know, some trades in, in the bank, then what's your plan to trade Teddy or Gutho to someone else? Does that mean you, you know, fire through dual position, you pivot to Ruben Garrick or something like that? Or do you just turn him straight into Val Holmes and cop the price loss? But, you know, you're not trading in turbo for a no no points this week. That's right. And it's probably probably Dane Laurie using that flexibility to move Laurie down to fullback and, and bring in a, a centre wing and, and stash a hell of a lot of money, you know, with the view to bringing Turbo in post-origin. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing. You'd want him for this round, but if he's not playing, you need the backup because you don't want to have Turbo not playing for three weeks in your team, especially when you're only bringing him in this week. So that's, I think, you know, obviously that's our Turbo-specific um, option there, but if you're looking at some other uh, players to bring in later in the round or whatever it is, then you know I definitely would recommend working through that and just being mindful of that as you're going through your five trades for this week. All right, Wolf. Well, we think we've covered that in excruciating detail from a strategic point of view, mate. Um, spoken about all facets of uh, what to do, not only this week but in the coming weeks. So I'm pretty confident that we've covered it all uh, for the night. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, as always, we'll try to bring the late mail edition this week. So starting on Thursday, as always. So we'll we'll drop that um, as soon as we can on the Thursday once we get the late mail in and we'll try to answer as many questions as you can. As always, make sure you subscribe so that drops into your podcast player as soon as it's available. 
and um, that'll make sure you don't miss it and you're not scrounging around wondering where it is. As always, thank you for listening. Thanks as always to the patrons. And we just want a quick shout out to the champs there. Uh, No doubt we'll catch up on the Discord again. But yeah, that's enough from us for tonight. Catch you again soon. Have a good one.